Hey guys, it is your girl Naj. I am here today to give you another video. Um, I just had to quickly hop on here and talk about the Better Up Uplift conference that's happening in San Francisco. And of course, Harry and Meghan haters are coming out of the woodwork. Um, it really just blows my mind. So let's sit down and talk about this because I feel like I have um, a, a particular aspect or opinion on this because I worked in San Francisco for about two years, two years, and I studied there um, postgraduate for uh, a year. Um, so I, I feel like I've, I've got, look, 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 I've gotten a glimpse into um, San Francisco culture, you know, it's really a startup city and as someone who works in advertising, who works in marketing, you know, like I feel like a lot of people from the UK got word from the video I think that the New York Post put out, which I thought that their post sounded a bit biased, which is weird because I don't know if it's the New York Post or the New York Times that usually seems pretty unbiased. It's definitely the New York Times. The New York Times is uh, authenticated, you know, genuine publication, unlike, you know, the Sky Newses and <laughs> the GB Newses and stuff of the world. But, um, yeah, the New York Post put out a video on YouTube and they basically said, oh, do you want to go see ha Prince Harry speak? Well, that's going to cost you a thousand, that's going to cost you a thousand dollars, that's going to cost you $995. So I just want to speak on this because the UK media is just relentless and the people who actually buy into this, you know, I feel sorry for them but at the same time I'm like, guys, you, you really need to, to understand the impact of your words and even your ideas, your thoughts, what you choose to spread online because we live in such a polarized world. I just feel like these people who are out here trolling and hating on Harry and Meghan, it's like they don't even, you know, they, they don't even know the damage that they're doing. They don't even know the, that how dangerous it is for you to just voice every single thought in your head. It's okay. Like, Harry and Meghan can go ahead, have their career outside of the firm, and you don't have to have a commentary on it. it. I mean, I don't understand. It's like they're saying, oh, you said you were going to go away and, you know, you weren't going to say anything. That's, that's the specific behavior of an abuser. So I lived in San Francisco, you know, worked at some ad agencies there, and I love that city. Um, there's definitely some quirks that come with living there, like the mission, <laughs> like the tenderloin. People who have been to San Francisco know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, God, if I can remember the area that I was staying in when I first got there, because it actually wasn't very, very far from where that movie with Julia Roberts was filmed. But it was one room and it was $1,400 a month. I'm telling you, when I went there to study, um... It was one room, a bedroom for $1,400. And, you know, that's not, right now with inflation, that's not too far off from 1,400 euro. I mean, it might be closer to 1,300 euro, but it's still a lot of m money for one room. <laughs> so, like, basically, um, when it comes to inflation, you know, San Francisco has an inherent infrastructural problem because it is a huge hub for business and technology that just boomed and bursted in a short amount of time in a very, very small, compressed, compact city, you know. And so you had Apple move in, you had Groupon, you had, um, you know, McDonald's and, 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 and um, what, what is it, the one that I'm trying to think of? You basically had the major, you know, SpaceX. Like, you basically had the major startups and unicorn companies move into San Francisco, um, where San Francisco just was basically a, a standard, you know, run-of-the-mill California-type city, type suburb, you know, before tech basically moved in. And then housing rates shot up. There wasn't enough room, you know, to take care of all of San Francisco's people. And, um, you know, 
there is a part of San Francisco that is very, very real, very point, very much points to the poverty in that city based, you know, in a paradoxical parallel against how much wealth and extravagance and decadence is in that city, you know. And when I was staying there, although I was paying $1,400 for a room, which I didn't stay there for very long, it might have been three to four months, eventually I moved into my own apartment, but it was in the East Bay, so in Berkeley, and uh, Berkeley is just as expensive, you know. Find an apartment there, you might not find a studio apartment below $1,600, below $1,800. So it's very expensive, but at the same time, I was making a lot of money in San Francisco because basically the cost of living is higher, but the minimum wage is higher, the average income, the average salary of the white collar professional is higher. So in the end, you could say it evens out, but it's still redonkulously expensive. Um, I have been a part of many large corporations, large businesses in Europe, in the U.S., who will in a hot second, yes, pay $995 for their employee to go to a business expo, a business exposition, a conference, a summit, that they feel will bring that value back to their company. They will jump on that. Independent entrepreneurs will jump on that. If I actually was in San Francisco, I would buy a ticket because these things can be... The only thing that I can think of is that the people who are dropping all these criticisms about Harry being in this conference are royalist, monarchist, you know, fanboys of the royal family who think that they are upholding their values, upholding their Britishness by denouncing Harry. And the American people who are doing it, it's the same coin. I mean, the people who are connecting over trashing these two humanitarians, these two people who basically in the grand scheme of things have not done anything that wrong. You know, compare it up against Prince Andrew. You know, compare it up to all the other corruption. Oh no, the light's changing. I'm sorry guys, the light's changing. The light's changing. But anyway, compare it up to all the other people who have done terrible things. You cannot sit here and tell me these two people deserve what they have gotten. They do not deserve the trashy plate that they have been served with a bunch of dog crap with a little sprig of cilantro slapped on it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, anyway, so basically, uh, and I hope you guys like my makeup today. I like, I was almost channeling my uh, 90s J-Lo sort of vibe, <laughs> but sort of more like Don Ward uh, makeup, you know? <laughs> anyway, um, I think that this conference is so, so positive for Prince Harry and of course Megan by association because we know that she's off doing great things as well like she's giving her husband time to shine and the haters hate that they they hate when they see her and they hate when they don't see her it's like guys please 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 like I don't know if you didn't take your medication today I don't know if you didn't take your chill pill but go take a chill pill it's 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 gonna be okay um, so, <laughs> um, basically where I feel this conference is going to be of value because maybe let me speak in a way where I can actually provide some insight, you know, or try to help the haters of Harry who are talking about him doing this conference and basically insinuating that he is grubby and greedy or that these, you know, the people who are uh, in charge of this organization are grubby and greedy for asking for $995 for a business conference. Let me talk about this in a way, you know, non-sarcastically, where I'm going to at least try to make you understand that, yes, people would go and spend that amount of money on a business conference. Um, since I guess some people, they really just can't wrap their head around that. <gasps> Ooh, people would want to go and see not just Prince Harry, but 
other professionals who could help my business grow or help my employees or even just help individuals that are having mental health issues. Like, the audacity for him to... Okay, okay, again. <laughs> let me stop being sarcastic. Okay, so let me basically try to explain as someone who has been, you know, within the management section of corporate America, of corporate parts of Europe, you know, who lived in San Francisco, who understands this work culture, um, let me just give my perspective. Absolutely, yes, businesses will spend that amount of money and even entrepreneurs will spend that amount of money. And I think what some people don't understand, which this further highlights that the targeted and continued hate that goes towards Harry and Meghan is organized by a bunch of very, very sad individuals, mostly older, middle-aged housewives, who think that they were in a relationship with Charles or Harry or something in some sort of delusional space in their head, or it's like they think that they had some sort of parenting um, authority over them in a detached over the TV type of way just because they saw them grow up on TV. I don't know. But it's clearly, they call Megan and Harry narcissists, but that right there is like clear narcissist, delusional. Like, I could go on all day as someone who studied Psychology 101 in college. <laughs> so, yes, um, I'm all in for um, Harry's conference. I'm all in support of that. And... I just wish him the best with his, all of his endeavors, you know. Um, I want to bring a little bit of a cultural thing into here because as someone, as an American, although I live in France, you know, so it might be a little bit of a different experience, you know, from the average American. I don't know. I've lived in France for the past five years. You know, I lived in London for six months. I've traveled and, um, you know, I wanted to live in Europe. And I love America. I love both of my, my countries. I love um, so many things about France. I love so many things about America. And there are so many things that make me so sad about the, both of these countries. Probably more so with America. But, you know, we're not going to get into that. You know, every, every, every place has its problems. It has its um, wins, you know, where it's really like, oh, yeah, we got to win. You know, and it also has its faults and stuff. And so, um, but something that I notice as an American and someone who prides myself on being American, but at the same time am aware of the things that my country of birth really kind of needs to work, in, work on or reflect on or where policies and things need to be changed. Um, I can say one of the biggest sort of personal attributes that I think I've taken away I can't give full credit just to America. It also has to be my family and my upbringing. I had a great childhood. And so um, I think the way that hard work, um, not complaining too much, work ethic, a strong work ethic, and um, positivity, you know, keeping a positive attitude, I feel like those are attributes that are really... American of sorts, you know, it's got a bald eagle slapped right all over it, so <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm kidding, um, but it's you get that right whereas in Europe I feel like it's much more process driven it's much more um, you know analytical in terms of feedback and criticism from children to education, you know, when you're in school to um, working in the professional sphere. sphere. Um, it's like, it's more process driven. It's not so much about just, you know, giving positivity or encouraging someone, whether that be your child, whether that be an employee, whether that be a student, you know, it's not just giving you encouragement for encouragement's sake. It's like, what did you do to earn it? That's, I, that's just how I feel the attitude in Europe really is. There's much more of a collaborative environment that at least I have seen in France than there is in the U.S. But in the U.S., independence is also really, really reinforced. And so, um, but at the same time, you know, those same faults and attributes, the other can, can it can be reflected. It could be a yin-yang thing. So, um, but at times, even me as an American who lives in Europe, 
I can pick up on that Europe, you know, um, whether that be where my, my husband's from, Portugal, whether that be where we live in France, whether that be where I used to live in the UK, generally, you know, and I having had tra traveled throughout Europe as well, in the Netherlands, I've been to the Netherlands, I've been to Spain, um, there is a level of pessimism, you know, or what Americans or people from other countries, you know, not necessarily just Americans, people from all around the world, what they might perceive as sort of a pessimism, you know, to Europeans. It's like they are very, very selective and picky about their wine, about their coffee, about their cigarettes, about their croissants, about their pastries. You know, we've seen that. We've seen that stereotype within, you know, books and media and stuff. And while a stereotype is a stereotype and it can always be something that's sort of superficial and sometimes more of a educated guess of a sum of a whole rather than the individual parts that make it up. You know, stereotypes also have some truth within them. And I definitely think that in Europe, especially in France, you know, they don't take fools lightly. And so I think that's what's happening with Harry and Meghan here. In the UK, they like to call it a, a stiff British upper lip, um, which whenever I just picture that expression, I just picture like a old white wrinkly man with like a very sweaty upper lip <laughs> guys okay not not trying to be racist my husband's white okay please don't persecute me don't execute me um i think what's happened is we've gotten very defensive about talking about race relations and the sort of what the future looks like because 60 years ago you know black people couldn't vote and 200 years ago even 150 years ago there were still black people picking cotton you know so even though we seem like we're really detached and we have entered into this new phase in society where we're elevated and we got our stuff going on um we have to continuously have these hard conversations whether it be about mental health whether it be about race whether it be about sexism, whether it be about LGBTQIA rights and and um, their sort of changing landscape and community, whether it be about climate change, you know, like these conversations are hard and I feel like we are in a polarized world. It's like you pick the right or you pick the left or you die, you know, it's like choose or die. And it doesn't have to be that way, you know. I feel like during, at least in the U.S., during President Obama's presidency and also during Bill Clinton's presidency, I mean, I'm only 31, so I feel like that's what I can really realistically comment on, you know, as far as just being that age. But even looking at John F. Kennedy as well, you know, um, there was one more... <laughs> and his name is slipping my mind. But those presidencies, uh, Jimmy Carter is the other one I was thinking of. Looking at uh, Obama, Clinton, Carter, you know, Kennedy, I feel like under those presidencies, which I think all of those were Democratic, <laughs> but we won't get into that. Um, I feel the weight around the country in the U.S. was... Um, sensitive to these topics and knew that it wasn't going to get solved overnight but these presidents made it a precedence to sort of evoke the the feeling of living in a multicultural world being able to coexist alongside one another coexist I want to like repeat that phrase coexist alongside one another I feel like Conferences like the Better Up Conference, this is something where, okay, it costs money because it costs money to operationally pull these things off, to have the speakers, to have food, to have entertainment, to have security, to have the venue, and San Francisco is not an inexpensive city. You know, if you just use your basic deduction skills and, and critical thinking skills, like stuff costs money. <laughs> so if you don't want to go, you don't have to go, but... There will be other people who might go to this, you know, who will go to this because they are willing to spend the money on that. 
But these are the type of things that, you know, those presidents that I just mentioned who invoked those, these are the type of things that keep those lines of communication open for these uncomfortable conversations, but doesn't just shut someone down because they want to have them. You know, when I look at the Megyn Kellys, when I look at the, um, what's her name, Camilla, I can't remember her last name, but the journalist, not, not Queen Camilla. Um, when I look at the Piers Morgans, I just feel like they are doing themselves a disservice because, I mean, and I know that they're making money for this, so can we really speak on this? But there's lots of people who aren't making money from this. They are just hateful little people somewhere behind a computer or a phone screen. Um, but that right there goes to show you that these are uncomfortable conversations that they don't want to listen to someone else's opinions. You know, like, you have to listen to other people and just try to understand instead of tear them down. I, I, again, I just, I, I feel like I'm tired of saying this. I really do. I feel like I'm tired of saying what people's moms have said to them since they were children, that you should allow other people to talk. You know, you shouldn't interrupt other people. You should be nice. You should be kind. Um, I, I feel like Trying to trying to do this is a thankless and new job. So um, I definitely am looking forward to virtually attending the Uplift, uh, you know, conference. If I cannot attend it physically, if I could attend it physically, just know that I would. And there's tons of people who will. Um, Prince Harry is a philanthropist, he's a humanitarian, he's someone who has gone through mental health struggles in his life, and he's trying to help others, you know, like, he's making money off of that because how do you guys live? <laughs> That's really what I want to know. What do you guys live on? Do you live on hot air, you know, like, he's working within his space of expertise and he is fueling that into something worthwhile and positive. Like, what can these people say? And, and he didn't sell his soul out to speak vitriol on people, you know, for the Sky News and the Daily Mails and on YouTube and stuff like a lot of people are doing. He's not profitizing off of somebody's name like a lot of people are doing. I mean, it is just so clear that so many people are literally just using Harry and Meghan's name for money. They, they would go to the extent of having people having mental breakdowns and, and health scares, like, for money. And they want to sit there and villainize these two people? Like, man, come on. Okay, I just... Um, but I'm really excited about the Uplift Conference. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Um... As I've said many times before, I love the UK. This is not a forum for me to sit here and trash the UK. Like, I, 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 I cannot emphasize how much fresh meat that I've watched on occasion. Um, how much skins that I've watched. Like, uh, the Tudors. How, much, how many books I've read about Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn. That's my girl. I mean, it's usually Anne Boleyn. But Elizabeth I, how many videos I've scrubbed on YouTube watching about, you know, the Tudor period uh, farmers, the stuff that I've watched on Brexit. And I've, and I've watched the coverage on Brexit just on bated breath, you know, on the edge of my seat, not out of, oh, look what they did wrong, look what they did here, oh my God, this is this, this is that, this is that, you know, although I think that Brexit was a mistake. I've been sitting here watching it, you know, feeling emotionally invested in my English sisters and brothers, you know, and I don't mean sisters and brothers by black people, I mean English people, period, over here, you know, and, and who are suffering, you know, especially the working average English person who's working on the fish docks, you know, who's who has a small business, the people who are driving the taxis, the people who are driving the, the delivery vans and the work vans, the bus drivers. I've been sitting here watching and I've, I mean, my heart is breaking and it's, it's, it's 
absolutely 100% contextually to do with what's going on with the with the royal family. You know, maybe it's not direct. Maybe I won't say it's 100% contextually related. It's indirect, okay? Like, this stuff is not at the end of the day going to be putting down, you know, paper and decisions on stuff that's going on with Brexit. But in the whole scheme of things, it is related. When you just have a country that's full of hate, people forget to be there for one another as, you know, their Tory and their Labour sisters and brothers, you know. Like another show that I love was Cuckoo, um, and a British show. And, you know, they're, the dad on there, he's really adamant about the Labour Party, you know, and it's really funny how he navigates through local politics, but, you know, the Tories and the laborers, they got to get along, guys. The, the American Democrats and the American Republics, they got to get along. And during those times of, 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 you know, Carter's presidency and Obama's presidency and Kennedy's presidency, you know, that was a time where there was a concerted effort, and you can see it, of we have difference of opinions, but we can still get along. I shouldn't have to be here telling y'all to, to try and sing Kumbaya, which you don't have to sing Kumbaya, but recognize that you can have a, be a view, you can have an opinion, and you can, <laughs> you can have that opinion and then you can move on. You don't have to become a, a Megan hate influencer across Quora, Reddit, and, and YouTube. You don't have to. If you don't like her, you can say your piece, you know, and then you can move on. Same thing with the UK media. You, okay, so maybe you guys saw some stuff that, you, you, okay, you can move on now. Even now that they basically aren't paying any attention to the UK. They're not paying any attention to the UK royals, at least. They said their piece through Harry's book, you know, through the, the Live to Lead documentary and to the Harry and Meghan documentary. And now they are starting to build their careers, and I feel so proud of Harry because he's basically building a career from scratch. Now, I know a lot of people will roll their eyes at me and say, oh, he has a silver spoon in his mouth his whole life, but that has all been a part of the firm. He's now stepping out and doing something for him, you know. He's, he's having the career that he probably would have had even if he wasn't a royal because that's just how life is. You know, we are... A combination of our experiences of our beliefs you know and sometimes all roads basically lead the same way he's doing what he's supposed to be doing and he's loving it and people are benefiting from it and people are welcoming him like there's no need to continue trashing him you know I think that Leilani of Barbados I, you know, and, and, and please don't come after me because me and my little channel, like, I, I barely have any followers and I do this more, you know, because out of my small little bit of followers out there, I know that they're listening to what I'm saying and um, what I say, I don't just put out there, you know, to make money or to monetize the channel. It's because it's something that I really believe and um, I think if you're going to motivate people, that's really got to be a part of your MO. It's got to be natural. And I went and looked at Leilani of Barbados's feed, you know, of her videos. And, like, her first maybe 10 videos, which was from about two years ago, 10 to 20 videos were about recipes, seemed like they were with her family members, more of a sort of vlogging you know, everyday life of look at my life experience. And at one hit, you know, it just looked like she maybe made one Megan video and it exploded. I exploded for her, which might be like, you know, I don't know. At that time, maybe it was like 2,000 views or something. But now she's up to things like 65,000 views. And from there, at that, that point two years ago, it looked like she made a, a Megan hate video. And then the next 100 videos are all Megan hate. So I'll, I'll let you guys make your decision on that. But let's get back to our ethics, guys. We don't have to be, we don't have to be mean and uh, vitriolic towards others, hateful towards others, just because the powers that be won't stop us. You know, somebody could be really really crazy you know really going out there physically hurting people 
you know, in a bad mental way. And because they get away with it, you know, because the powers that be don't stop them, they keep going. But would you say that that was still right? Okay, so now think of doing that to another human being, you know. Do you think it's still right? You might get your little fix off of it, whatever that is. If it's a dopamine fix, if it's some extra views on your channel and you're able to monetize it more, you might get your little fix. But at the end of the day, can you really say you're happy with yourself? So anyway, um, thank you guys for being with me. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Um, I have a little channel here, but I, I think that there are people out there who um, could use the motivation, who value the things that I say, and I'm always open for a little bit of healthy debate, you know, as long as everybody's nice. So if you have a contradicting view, I, I would love for you to put it in the comments, but if it's just ignorant, I probably won't respond but you know if it's healthy debate i'm all for it so i will see you guys in the next video thank you so much for being here peace out